Hi, I'm Katie Kroll. I'm the Senior Product Manager of Global Baseball Strategy at Hawkeye Innovations, and this is her table. Now you see her. You are magnificent! Welcome to Her Table, the podcast that shines a spotlight on the badass women who are redefining the game. Join hosts Kate Foley and Megan Martinez as they unlock the secrets of success from the brightest female pioneers in the industry. Welcome back to Her Table. We are so excited to have Katie Crawl on the show today. She is a former development coach for the Red Sox, and she is currently an adjutant professor at Northwestern University, where she teaches sports business. Katie is not only a badass professor, she is also a senior product manager and focuses on global baseball strategies. She is all about the analytics and the numbers and the metrics of how to make these players excel and succeed on and off the field. I'm so excited to hear about Katie's story. I can't wait to learn more about baseball analytics. So Katie, please pull up a seat at her table. Okay, well, cool. Well, we are, we're so excited to have you on today. Thanks so much for making time. I know it's the middle of the day, so I appreciate it. Definitely happy to be here. Thank you both. And she's a Catherine with an E-R-I-N-E, Megan. So mm. I know. And her, she has a twin sister named Anne. And no Anna, way. Anna. And so they go by Katie and Annie. And my family calls me Katie Anne. That's so crazy. That's Good weird. Name. Hybrid. Names, hybrid. I'm like a hybrid over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my middle name's Catherine, but I spell with a Y. So okay, sure. I'm not part of the crew. I know. No. I was like doing the questions. It was so funny. I'm like Kate dot dot Katie, and I was like, oh, that's so fun. Like just like putting it together. <laughs> there's a uh, there's two girls that work at Epic, and both of their names are Katie, and so any and we all spell it differently. So I'm Kate, and then there's a Katie with a Y and a Katie mm-hmm. with an I E. So then, like when we go somewhere, you just have to say one name, but you're you have to be specific on the email of like Katie mm-hmm. S or. <laughs> Katie K or Kate. It's like which like the Bachelor, I? you know, <laughs> like Rachel S. <laughs> so true. Totally, totally. Okay, so where are you at now? So based in Chicago. When the okay. Red Sox season ended last year, I moved back home. So like did my undergrad in Chicago, my MBA from U Chicago. So this has always been home for me, but have moved around quite a bit. So it's been nice actually to be back around friends and family. Amazing. Yeah. I love it. Is it still cold there or is it like making the turn? It's, it's actually always, been it's always cold in Chicago though. Like well, totally, Kate, but it's actually been like 50s the past few days. So it's been quite lovely. Yeah. Like I've gotten like for runs like along the lake and like you don't have to wear a Canada goose coat anymore, <laughs> which is a nice change. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It's getting so nice here in Phoenix because it's like 80 and I'm like, oh, it's coming. But then it's like short little stint of 80 and it's Oh you get God. spring training starting too. I'm sure there's tons we of do. Yeah. We do. We do. Um, my husband is actually from Boston. So oh, cool. big Red Sox family uh, over here, like diehard Patriots Red Sox. So awesome. it's always interesting, uh, interesting in our house because the Red Sox are in Florida, but everyone else is in Phoenix. So it's kind of like we have to spread the love around. Spread yeah. around. Yeah. I like Arizona spring training because everything's so much closer. Like in Florida, um, it's like an hour yeah. or so drive. Any, but like in Arizona, you can be like almost anywhere in like 20 minutes for the complexes. It's just hotter than sun in the summer. Right. It's, just, it's just a little bit warm. Oh, well, I'm so excited to have you on. I know Megan and I are just thrilled because I love meeting women that are just championing and breaking glass, glass ceilings and just – leading the path for so many other women. So how did you get started in this? Was this like your dream job growing up or did you kind of find a path and led you there? Definitely. I would say my mom introduced me to baseball in many ways in that she taught me how to keep score. She would pull me out of school to go to Cubs and Sox games. So it definitely stems from her in many respects. And then once I read Moneyball when I was 13 years old, I figured that there would be an opportunity for me that didn't necessarily involve playing shortstop and being a member of a team in uniform that you could carve a role for yourself in a front office. So that really was my objective at Northwestern is get experiences on my resume that would position me well to be in baseball operations for a front office. And so was lucky enough to play on the World Series Trophy Tour for the Cubs in 2016. And even though that was on the business side, being a Chicagoan and being part of that, that really cemented my desire to say, okay, this is the industry that I want to try to carve my career in. Wow. Did you play? Like, did you play softball growing up? Did you play sports? Yes. Yeah. Played softball. Um, my dad was our coach and uh, bless his heart. He loves football. Like he likes sports, but he is not a big softball or baseball guy. Like he'll go to games, but he's not necessarily going to like 
play the Immaculate Grid every morning. So um, <laughs> when I was like um, just right 11, 12, like right around that Moneyball era, uh, I would like set the rosters and I would set the lineups for our teams. So wow. I would say, okay, um, you know, I think that Annie should hit second because she's our best hitter rather than slotting her in the cleanup spot. And so that was probably like my first exposure to roster construction and to putting together a team because my dad said, you know more about this than I do. Why don't you go ahead? And so I uh, played softball and then my Annie and I both played golf um, through high school and were recruited, but ended up not playing at Northwestern because I knew I wanted to graduate in three years. And we figured if we like took the offers we had like at Georgetown and Yale or Wash U, we'd probably have to stay for four or five years. So you know, I mean, yeah. you drop a couple of those schools. I mean, okay. like, <laughs> like, oh, we decided to choose between, you know, Georgetown and Yale. Yale, like, so yeah. casually, too. <laughs> She's like, you know, Yale, Georgetown. Oh, Kate okay, and I are like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I got such a wear, but we don't actually go there. Like, no, it's fine. It's so I think it, it honestly worked out because I think if Annie and I had both golfed, we probably would have gone to separate schools. Like, I love D.C. I love Georgetown. I think Annie maybe would have wanted to play, like, at, a, like, a Vanderbilt or something that like was definitely like super competitive D1. So like being able to be roommates together and just have that experience of like going to undergrad at the same place is really cool. Are you guys identical twins or fraternal? Fraternal. Twins? I've got a few photos behind me. I don't know if it would come through. I can show. Um, but I don't think we look that much like we get like cousins a lot, but very rarely do people say, oh, I see you look like sisters. You guys have like the same temperament or are you like polar opposites? Because I find sometimes it's similar. Or sometimes it's like nothing like. Mm -hmm. They're in a womb and that's all. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. No, I know a lot of twins who are kind of like polar opposites. I would say, um, if you first meet us initially, people definitely think, oh, you have similar mannerisms and like the way you carry yourselves, very similar. Um, but like Annie's a total introvert, which is kind of ironic because she's like a news reporter. So she's at the <laughs> NBC affiliate in St. Louis and That's she's like quite really charming and personable, but she also will like on weekends sleep for 16 hours, just like recover <laughs> from being on. Um, like I think she's sleeping right now. Today's her off day. <laughs> so um, from that perspective, like I love being around people and I feel like I get my energy from being around others, but Annie definitely needs that time to recharge and kind of, you know, just watch like old episodes of Gossip Girl. <laughs> so interesting your both. That's so, awesome. It's so interesting. Like yeah. it's it's wild. It's it's wild. So did you ever when you were playing softball see someone that you were like, I want to be her? Like I think that for me is what the show's all about, right? Is everyone sees Katie and they're like, We want to be her. How did Katie become Katie in baseball? Yeah, honestly, Kate, like, no, I never saw a female coach. And I think part of the reason why it was so powerful to be hired by the Red Sox and why I was so willing to leave Google to take the job was because I recognized that this was a very small sorority, that it was a growing group of women. But like when I went to games growing up, there was no Alyssa Nacken, there was no Bianca Smith, there was no Rachel Balkovic. So I think like the power of having somebody on the field in a ponytail is pretty extraordinary. And like now we have a generation of women and girls who have only ever known a world in which there are female coaches. I love so that. Amazing. Katie, you talk about like how the Red Sox found you, right? Like how did you even get into being a coach for the Red Sox? Like that is such an incredible mm -hmm. accomplishment. You're young and it's like to have already been a coach for them is just like mind blowing to me. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, it was definitely like a privilege and one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. And I honestly, like even at Northwestern, if you had told me that I was going to be a coach for the Red Sox, I would have said there's a better chance I'm a mascot. You know, there's just like, there's no way that I'm like, I don't have the skill set. I just I could never picture it. Um, and so I was at Google and I, I'd been at the Cincinnati Reds for two years in baseball operations. And I was wrapping up my MBA and I I wanted to stay in baseball, but I also kind of wanted to try like a deep end almost and see if I could um, like really handle myself in the environment that was Google and big tech. But I was like staying in touch with some baseball contacts. And so a former coworker who worked with me in Cincinnati was with the Red Sox and we were catching up one day and he's like, hey, I know they're hiring a few roles in player development. I know it's an area that you've always said you've been interested in. Do you want me to connect you? So had um, a conversation. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Milwaukee, but there's this place called Mars Cheese Castle, which is like the most iconic Wisconsin um, type of bar. And I remember getting a phone call from Chris Stacio, who's the Red Sox assistant director of player development. And he walked me through like what the coaching position would entail. And he said it would be pitch design and advanced scouting and you'd coach first base. And I said, Chris, I think this would be phenomenal. But candidly, would you consider hiring a woman? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's have you 
talk to a few more people. So had like 18 or 20 interviews or something that was like really robust. And then they offered me a job and I called my boss at Google and I said, if it was anything else, I wouldn't take it. But I, you know, don't want to be 80 years old and talking to my granddaughters and say, oh, I could have been a coach for the Red Sox. I want to say, you know, there's my old uniform. Go try it on. Um, That's so great. And what were you doing at Google? Like on their global strategy team. So my friends at business school, they called it Google's black ops team. <laughs> we were focusing on Google workspace. So like um, Gmail, G chat, G drive, all of those just like really providing different ways that we could like help small businesses and larger companies use those tools. And what did you end up getting your degree in? Cause that's two different things. You went from like, you know, Google, the, the black ops team over <laughs> to the West Coast. Like that's not even like in the same stratosphere of career path. What drove you, you know, where, from college, what did you focus on in college? And then how did you, were you recruited to go to Google? How does that work? So many people want to work there. I don't like, Yeah, definitely. I, um, I actually was a history major at Northwestern. So people say to me all the time, how do you have a job at all, let alone a job in baseball? <laughs> I think there's like a deep um, liberal arts bias, unfortunately. But <laughs> the case, like at the Red Sox, I felt like my history major obviously was like a very quantitative role. And so part of the reason why I got my MBA was because I wanted more of those technical skills. But like when I'm talking to a player, I'm synthesizing information, I'm conveying a narrative about his season what he has to do. All of that storytelling is no different if you're talking about somebody's like career trajectory or the fall of the Roman Empire. So I really felt like if anything like that Northwestern undergrad experience was absolutely crucial for me to then pivot into baseball and then tech, honestly, too, like when you're communicating with executives and stakeholders, the way that you're able to present your ideas in like a concise manner and like really make an impact, not a lot of, you use numbers, but it's not necessarily exclusively data driven. Do you feel like that's a powerhouse for you as a woman to be able to storytell and kind of narrate and have a more personal side? I mean, I think in sports, sometimes I think we get caught up a lot in numbers and just what is the line, you know, what is the stat line? And that's what it is. It doesn't tell the full story of like a season or an athlete's ability. Do you feel like that's something that you identified really early on? You wanted to differentiate, differentiate yourself with, right, uh, in the sports space? Absolutely. I feel like written and verbal communication skills, Kate, do not get enough attention. And obviously, like STEM degrees are incredibly valuable and can open a lot of doors for you. But I think as a woman in particular, being able to substantiate what I think and how I believe or the way that I reach my conclusions, I have to be able to do that um, because failing to do so not only undermines my position, but probably gets me in fewer meetings, puts me on fewer projects. So to be able to substantiate why I want to work on something is really important. Well, Katie, I'm on the NFL side and my brother, he worked in scouting for years. And so he kind of would tell me about like the analytics and everything. And so when I was like learning about you, I was like so fascinated by the baseball analytics side. So kind of take me through like what, how you even come up with the numbers. What are you measuring? I know you do like bat hitting numbers mm -hmm. and then you're trying to improve the players on the field. So how, like take me through even like going about the process of that. Definitely. Um, so I would say, Megan, we're in a really unique era where thanks to Hawkeye Data, which is the company where I currently work and one of the reasons why I gravitated towards the role, with Hawkeye Data, we can track everything. We can track the spin on the ball. We can track how hard you hit it, where the players are positioned. Even we have skeletal models where we can say, oh, this is where your elbow was. This is where you're maybe not necessarily getting enough rotation. Maybe this player is at risk for injury. So like, it's pretty incredible. So from that perspective, I would say we're at a place where we can evaluate players to a degree where we never could previously. Like part of the reason why the Dodgers signed Yamamoto to the deal that they did is because we have projection systems and we have models now where we can say, okay, this player who's never thrown a pitch in Major League Baseball before, we have all of his NPB data. We know based on how he did in Japan, how he'll probably fare in the States, which is really cool because wow. you're obviously making very educated guesses, but now you have more information in order to substantiate it. In terms of talking to a player, um, some really interesting numbers that I would say have come about in the past few years are expected numbers. So expected numbers are how well we think you're going to do. So maybe we think a player is going to have like a 380 WOBA for a season, WOBA being weighted on base average, which is a metric that's like pretty common parlance. Let's say he doesn't hit that 380. Let's say he's closer to 300. I can sit next to him, and this happened with um, Pedro Castellanos, who was on the Red Sox with us. I can say, Pedro, like, I know you're a little discouraged. I know you feel like you're not reaching base often enough. You're not scoring enough, but 
here's how we're projecting you to do based on the quality of contact that you're making. You're just running into some outfielders who are perfectly positioned or you're just you're not necessarily getting to first as quick, but that's not your fault because of the field or the conditions for that day. So that's really cool, too, in the sense of I can use that as a tool with a player and say you're doing everything right. Luck's just not on your side right now. So we have something to like quantitatively say this is what the baseball gods are doing to you. Do the teams oh. share that data? Like, or is it like team specific data? Because I know like on the NBA side, like it's, it's the same thing. We can tell you how many times you shoot, where's the ball, mm-hmm. but like teams don't share that data. It is internally done because it's at the practice facility where I feel like because of, you know, how much does that go into AAA, single A, the feeder teams? Are you guys using that same data? Is it across the league or is it kind of team owned and then down into the feeder teams? Really good question. So I would say um, there's common stats. Like you can take a look at what Cody Bellinger's um, 98th percentile exit velocity was for last season, but then each teams will calculate their own metrics. And so um, pitch grades in particular is something that every team does. So you can have, let's say like Garrett Cole and the Yankees. The Yankees have a way to say Garrett Cole's fastball is X compared to Joe Musgrove's fastball at the Padres. And so those, I would say, Kate, are proprietary in the sense of they're using different ingredients to put together what they believe is the best evaluation of the pitchers in question. So yeah, they're definitely, um, like if you ever talk to analysts and they're interviewed and someone asks them, oh, what's your favorite stat? What do you often use? They'll often say, oh, well, something at the Yankees or something at the Dodgers that we don't disclose to anyone, which is like not that helpful when you're reading an interview, you know, because they're, they're kind of saying like, oh, it's something you can't see. <laughs> I'm going on a game show with her, Megan. Like she, I feel like she has every, like can figure out like, what is this stat? What is this record? What is this? I'm over there, like, I, I don't, who are you talking about? What do we, wait, fo- trying to follow along. And I'm like, so much knowledge is inside. Oh, I know. Trust me, I'm sitting here just like taking it all in. Like, oh my gosh, like this is so cool. Like, <laughs> maybe I should go back to school. Like, I don't feel educated all of a sudden on like what I need to do here. No, I bet I your basketball and football knowledge is way beyond mine, though. I mean, it's there's amazing people like you that I lean on where I'm like, okay, I know visually, I know, but what do the metrics say? Because I think mm-hmm. athletes, it's become so competitive for athletes across all sports, right? Uh, Everybody is doing the same type of training, the same type of rehab, the same type of musculoskeletal like regeneration, right? And the analytics really, everyone's leaning into it because everything used to be an eye test. Mm -hmm. Like, especially I feel like old school baseball was an eye test. Like you would eye test, eye test, eye test. And you'd see these kids throw, pitch, you'd get your little gun and, you know, count how fast they're throwing things. It's not that anymore because everything is like risk assessment. Right. It's not how fast you can do something or how good you are. It's what are the risks and what are the what I call them, like the black ops of like, how does this go wrong Mm -hmm. Um, for an athlete? Because they're good today doesn't mean they're going to be good for 10 years, especially with the amount of money that goes on in sports. And the length of these contracts is just insanity. And baseball is quickly catching up with basketball, if not superseding it now with some of these contracts. Um, how do you find yourself in a room? I mean, are you the only girl in the room most of the time? I would assume that you're probably one of few. Yeah, I would say it's definitely, um, like we're clearly a minority. I remember one time during COVID, I was on a Zoom call for the Reds and my sister walked by and she was like, oh my gosh, you're the only woman. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess you're right. You know, I think unfortunately it's somewhat like normalized at this point, um, but it is really lovely when you have female coworkers, like it's, it's such a breath of fresh air because I love working with women. And so whenever I can like, like we had great um, software engineers at the Reds who were female at MLB, I had some great female coworkers. It's awesome when I get to work with them. What has been one of the biggest challenges for you as a woman in a male dominated sport? I mean, you work in men's sports, like you don't work in softball like how how is what's a big challenge for you coming into this industry like what was a a challenge you had to conquer good question i would say the the trickiest part is you feel like there are instances where you're not included or you're not necessarily given the exposure that you feel like some of your male peers are which can be frustrating because you can't necessarily call it out and say oh well you invited daniel to that meeting and not me (laughs) right like Sports are so territorial. And so you want to be grateful and you want to be appreciative, but it's hard when you like know in your heart, hey, put my resume up against his. I know what I have to offer, right? And so you have to kind of like tread this fine line of, you know, you want to be proactive and you want to try to advance, but you also 
you know, kind of recognize there are going to be moments when you get passed over. And so it's yeah. just kind of like emotionally reckoning and accepting that. I know, Kate, and I can definitely relate to being the only woman in the <laughs> crowd of men. Have you ever had instances where you felt like you have to prove yourself just because you are surrounded by so many men or like an instance where it's like you had to come like more prepared than any of any of your male counterparts? Yeah, definitely. I mean, honestly, Megan, I think like the Red Sox was such a fishbowl environment. Like I obviously had like worked at the league office. I'd worked for the Reds for two years. But when you're in a clubhouse, it's a total fishbowl. So like people see who you speak to, who you don't. Um, you have to be like very cognizant of the way you present yourself. So I would definitely say when we would have like our one-on-one -on -one meetings where it would be like myself and a pitching coach and a player, myself, our hitting coach and a player, like I wanted to walk in and have all my notes. Like I'm, I'm still pretty old school. I keep notebooks. Like I write things out. I have lists. I have my Lily Pulitzer calendar. Um, so from that perspective, I, I always had to do my homework. And mm -hmm. like something that I've always tried to embody is like spend your life studying for pop quizzes because when you get called mm -hmm. on and you have to be in that position, you have to perform. I'm um, stealing that from you, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> what did you say? Prepare your life for pop quizzes? Yeah, spend your life studying for pop quizzes. Because it's true. You know, like there were so many times at MLB where someone would say, oh, Katie, like, hey, can you do some research on um, CBA negotiations? We have like a meeting with the umpires next week. And like I had to have been done with like all my other like salary arbitration or rule change analysis work so I could say yes to that. You know, like I never wanted to be in a position where I was like, oh, I was too busy. Oh, I don't have the time. I always wanted to seem like, yeah, I'm available. I can help you, whatever you need. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel like for you, I think we talk about all the time on the show, women want to go above and beyond. We're very nurturing. We're very hardworking. Have you ever been in an instance where you're like, okay, I need to delegate. I'm not, I am not the best delegator. I'm not, I'm still working on it every day. I'm like, work mm -hmm. hard of delegating because you feel like, especially as a woman in, in men's sports, if I don't do everything, they're going to give it to someone else. And then that person might get an opportunity if before me or something, you know what I mean? It's like that fear factor of saying like, I just, I'm going to hold all this here and then no one else can have that success. Have you ever been in that situation where you kind of kind of like check yourself and be like, okay, I need to delegate. I'm overwhelmed or I got too much. Or are you a hold it in kind of person? Yeah, no, Kate, it's really hard to say no. And especially I think like when I was like really on, early on in my career and cutting my teeth, like I wanted to be in code review meetings with the analytics department, even if that wasn't necessarily in my job description. I think the trickiest thing I've found is when I do have that scope creep of my role and I feel like I really am expanding, then being able to substantiate to management, oh, well, this is why I think that like I should have like a higher title or maybe like why like my role has expanded. It's almost like, and I see a lot, this happens to women very often, like you put so much on, so much on and you've raised the bar for yourself and people just assume, oh, well, Katie always does it. <laughs> right. Versus yeah. Necessarily saying like, oh, like you like at the Reds, we had like um, 13 people leave in two years. So I, like, I took on a lot of those responsibilities and I'm so appreciative for it. And I feel like it exposed me to so many different things. But like when I left the Reds, they hired two men to replace me. Right. Because the workload was. I just mean, obviously, Katie, come <laughs> That's on. That's crazy. That's amazing. I love that. That's so cool to be like they hired two men to like to keep up with what I did. Two of you to equal, to just sniff a version of me. Not even yeah. on this, okay? I mean, that's, that's like amazing. the best ever. You should have that written on a mirror. So <laughs> yeah. Well, and they're great guys and they called me afterwards and they were like, we didn't know you were doing all this. I mean, we knew you worked a lot, but you had like basically three or four people's jobs. I think that's what's so hard, especially in sports, is sometimes it's the work just has to get done. Yeah. And, you know, some team members are great and some are the people that just do their job and nothing more, nothing less. And then the people that want to grow and expand. I think I've heard that a lot lately of, of women not wanting to say, hey, I'm taking on more. So my salary should increase. My role mm -hmm. should increase. My responsibilities are increasing but my visibility is not increasing. I like that. And it's weird yeah. because I feel like women were like scared to do that when I was reminded by one of my mentors, like a guy, what we talked about on the show, I think Megan, a guy would walk in there and say, I want a raise, I want a title change mm -hmm. and I have all this responsibility and not bad an eye. But yeah. for some reason we feel like we're gonna be difficult or asking for too much or not knowing our role. And I think that's why it's, it's so important for women in sports and leadership, you know, like women in leadership positions to really elevate and push people to know their worth, yes. to be respectful, but like to know your worth. So then the next you 
mm-hmm. doesn't have to fight so hard. And that's what it's it's really for me all about in sports is how do I change it for the next me because I'm having to fight it out, but the next me is going to have it easier because those people are like, wait, we can't do that again. We can't say that again. We can't act that way again. Right. Um, we need to recognize it. But I think, you know, you hit it right on the head and I just took two of them to replace me. But would you say that you probably looking back had an opportunity to speak up and you just did it or you were afraid to speak up? Yeah, I definitely think it was an attitude of like, I want to be happy to be here. I want to be really appreciative. And like, I loved the work, like candidly, like whether it was MLB, whether it was the Reds, the Red Sox, like the 12, the 14 hour days never bothered me because it, it they're the coolest jobs in the world, you know? So yeah. it's not necessarily like you're working on widgets or you're like at a consulting firm and you're helping like a financial services site redo their, you know, um, expense accounts. Like yeah. this is like, you're talking about like players being promoted and making trades and signing for agents. So it's all really cool. But um, I honestly, honestly, Kate, like, I don't think I would change it for anything looking back because there have been so many instances where I've been in situations where I've thought, oh, well, because I had that experience in Cincinnati. Oh, well, because I was part of that conversation in New York. Now I have like a more comprehensive understanding. I feel like it's so important for women to champion other women. You know, I I get that with NFL. I know Kate's Kate does that with me. She does that with everybody. When I'm, you know, we went to Vegas summer league, she's introducing me to every single person. And I'm like, wow, I'm so appreciative. And I love that. And I want to be that way towards, you know, the next me, like we always talk about now for you, has there ever been like a woman? Um, I know MLB is just, there's so many men. And so has there been women in leadership that you can look up to that you've kind of um, learned from that you can now pass on to the younger you or the next yeah, year? Um, Kim Ang hired me when I was at MLB. I remember I was 21 years old. I was in my sorority dorm room and I got an email from MLB that I was going to interview with Kim Ang. And I remember calling my mom and I said, this is the Michael Jordan of female sports executives. Like I can't believe she's going to take 30 minutes to talk to me. And so the position that I ended up being hired for by MLB, it was the final round was four interviews with four SVPs and Kim was the first one. And so like to this day, I truly believe like if Kim hadn't passed me through, like I probably wouldn't have gotten that job. Like I probably wouldn't have gotten hired by the Reds. So from that perspective, like I I owe her a great debt and I am always very cognizant of that. So to see her become the first female GM and MLB of the Marlins and to think about like what she did for me, I think is really powerful. Um, In terms of the next generation, Megan, I would say um, like something I'm very proud of is there's a woman who's now a senior social media coordinator at the Red Sox. And I had just started at MLB in New York and my mom called and said, Hey, there's a family friend. Um, their daughter really wants to work in baseball. She's at um, like, she was the minor league team at the time. Will you talk to her? So I talked to her and she was like, so lovely, but her resume like needed a little bit of work. And so I said, let me hunt around in New York and let me see what we can find. So she ended up getting a marketing internship at the league. And then a few months later hired by, the Red Sox and I was home one fall and my parents do these really big Northwestern football tailgates. We're like a, a very big Northwestern family. <laughs> and so Maria's dad was there and um, he said to my mom, I was off with like friends. He said, where's Katie? I want to meet the life changer. And it was like gosh. really powerful to think about like Maria getting that chance. Oh my gosh. I know. That's, you- so sweet. That's so powerful because it's one person right mm-hmm. you made that but that one person impacted oh, you make me cry. I, I know right <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh my god I, I love that you're looking back now and they looked back right because i think it's mm-hmm. so easy to especially in sports like climb the ladder climb the ladder climb the ladder climb the ladder mm-hmm. and you forget that you need to thank the people that are putting the spokes for you to keep climbing and so that's so special really? too for her family to recognize like you took time and like, I'm sure in that moment you're like, yeah, cool, I'll do it. And sure, I'll talk to you and it's whatever. But mm-hmm. it's so impactful for her in that moment that it Definitely. changed her life. Mm-hmm. It has to be like so rewarding to know that like something so small but so big has the ability to do that. And that's what, that's what the show is, right? It's like, how's the next, you know, the next you inspire them? Because so many young women don't know what they want to do or don't know what's open to them. Mm-hmm. And it's not like your path went straight to sports, which is what's fascinating. I think Mm -hmm. majority of women in sports and leadership did not start in sports at all. They started somewhere else and then identified a path or or created a path to get there. Mm -hmm. If you weren't working in sports, what would you be doing? 
Oh, I actually am somewhat doing it now in that I'm uh, I'm actually teaching at Northwestern, which okay. I really loved. So I taught a class last fall on financial accounting and sports economics. And then this quarter, I'm teaching class on organizational theory and sports leadership. So I really love it. So I, I honestly feel, Kate, if I weren't in sports full time, I would love to like get a PhD in art history and just be a professor and kind of be in my ivory tower and write papers and give lectures. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, we gotta like go to her class. I feel like I <laughs> know. I it's probably think like be great guest lectures. But, listen, we have, we'll come in. We're okay. happy to do it. Seriously, it, what's oh wait? I know Chicago. Just can it Get be in the, the summer? Can it be in like the fall? Like I don't want to do January. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> September, October. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the warm March, the green. Don't you guys do like a green lake for St. Patty's Day? Yeah. Yeah. The, the river, mm-hmm. yeah. the river. Like, yeah. let's go. We'll have to tell production like we do I go from the boat in the Green River. They'll be yeah. like, no, 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 and no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, what for you do you want to see continue to change for women, girls, and sports? I mean, I think you know. Has there been, and forgive my ignorance, but when you grew up, you played softball. Mm-hmm. Do you ever want to play baseball? Were you ever told you couldn't play baseball? Like, there's been, you know, significant changes that have come, but has that ever been a thing? Really good question. Uh, never even considered baseball because it wasn't accessible. And I think Liz Ben, who used to be at MLB, who's now the director of baseball apps at the Mets, she has done really cool work under the umbrella of Baseball for All that is introducing and exposing girls not to softball, but to baseball. I think the tricky thing is from like a college athletic scholarship perspective, as you guys probably know, like there are very few college baseball scholarships. And so I think you have like a lot of really strong female athletes who say, okay, I could either go to Northwestern for free on a softball scholarship, or I could keep playing baseball. I could like keep fighting the stigma that's going to be inherent in the sport. And so from that perspective, I think you're always going to run into that because like the proposition of a free college degree to a really good university is going to be hard for anyone to turn down. In terms of other things I would like to see change or be different, I really think it's female leadership at the executive levels. Like, I think the only way you're going to get meaningful change when it comes to like maternity and paternity leave for women in front offices is going to be someone in the sweet C suite saying, wait a minute, what are we doing for this? And I think right now a lot of sports leagues have been focused on that entry level hiring of how do we get women and people of color internships or analyst jobs. And then you see a lot of really qualified women and people of color leave for higher paying jobs and jobs where there are more women and people of color. So I would say like it's really getting women in at like that director, that VP level who can then have that trickle down change. Uh, Because right now, like you don't just want a revolving door of really qualified female data scientists coming in, getting burnt out and then leaving and going to Microsoft or going to Amazon. I don't even think people think, Megan, about like, I mean, I don't even know what she just said, like something data analyst, like beyond my scope of education. (laughs) But you just think like, okay, there's grounds people, there's trainers, there's coaches, there's, you know, front office, there's GMs, equipment people, but like there's actually data analysts. How many data analysts work for each team? So I would say the Rays and the Yankees probably have the most robust staffs. So I think they could have like 40 or 50 analysts. But then you have a lot of smaller teams like the White Sox and the Marlins who probably only have like eight or 10. So it definitely varies. Um, But I think everyone has recognized that the competitive advantages that you can get from someone who's upstairs and building a defensive positioning model can add up in a way that um, spending $8 million, we call it um, like $8 million per war. So war is wins above replacement. So if I were like a GM and I wanted to go out and make my team one win better for this upcoming season, on the free agent market, it would basically cost you $8 million versus I could hire two data scientists who are going to cost way less than that to identify ways where we can maybe set our lineup more effectively, where we can position our fielders more effectively. And so I think that's why teams like the Rays and the Yankees have really doubled down in that area. Well, we briefly touched on contracts. And so I'm curious, do, do like your analytics, your data, does that kind of back up these players' contracts that you're getting? Does it maybe like help, you know, oh, this, this person should get a higher amount of money because I can give you these, like this data to back it up. And like, do you have a big part in the contract negotiations and kind of, you know, giving them their deals? 100%. Yeah. So every team has their own projection model, Megan. And so that's why like when the Dodgers signed Otani to that $700 million deal, that's because based on their projections, that's what they thought he was worth. Because you're basically taking the best available free agent hitter 
and the best available free agent pitcher. And so that's why the deal is so lucrative because they took the numbers for those as individual entities and then said, oh wait, it's one human being. So from that perspective, every team might calculate it differently. Like maybe the Nationals thought that he was worth 680 over 12 years. So there might be variance in that. But yeah, like when you're negotiating with agents now, like everyone has like different walkaway numbers and such, but most people try to rely on those projection models. And then when it comes to salary arbitration, salary arbitration being like pretty unique to baseball, um, like all of that is driven by numbers. And there are certain numbers that carry more weight in the sense of like, if you're a closer, like if you were Blake Trinan in 2018 and you had that really historic season where you had a ton of saves, part of the reason why he won that hearing and why he was able to set the bar so high is because saves are a really crucial indicator and driver in that market. Whereas like a pitcher's win loss record maybe isn't that important. So of all the numbers that you have available to you, the union and um, the teams will like strategically pick out the ones to showcase to substantiate their points. Oh. I mean, that's it's just so much. Like it's, awesome. I mean, yeah. it's funny <laughs> yeah. because I think as a consumer, right? Like I'm not, a, I'm not huge into baseball. It's like, I see that deal and I break it down from like the agent side where I'm like, okay, He's getting two million a year, right? For mm-hmm. the next couple of years. Great. Taxes are high in California. <laughs> so yeah. like money right now while we live here, um, because we don't want to pay <laughs> we don't want to pay the taxes. Thing. <laughs> it all matters then because ultimately mm-hmm. you can make more money the better the deal is structured. When it comes down to a deal like that, it's structured so finite, right? Mm-hmm. Is that the team driving that number? Is that the agent driving the number? Or is that a hybrid of both with analytics brought in to support it? Because that's the kind of an unheard. Everyone heard the big number, but they didn't understand the breakdown mm-hmm. of that contract. Exactly. And it's more lucrative for him tax-wise. I mean, he's going to retire making more money than anyone probably ever does in their whole life. But he's going to be in, you know, probably in a tax-free state. I don't know. <laughs> Texas, Florida, somewhere that doesn't require that many taxes mm-hmm. in California, meeting that type of income. Is that like a round robin conversation or is that part of the negotiation tactic? Really interesting question. So the deferred compensation is a newish trend in baseball in the sense of like the Nationals were one of the first teams to do it with Steven Strasburg and Max Scherzer. And you're seeing now like a little bit of back and forth between Steven Strasburg's camp and the Nationals because he's technically on the 40 man, but he's not necessarily going to play this year. So moving that money creates a ton of roster flexibility if you're a GM. Right. So if you're Andrew Friedman, whoever's going to play, replace you 10 or 20 years from now is going to have to deal with that Shohei Otani money. <laughs> but it allows you to then go and say, OK, I can sign you know, um, from like the Otani negotiations. From what I know, like Otani was very adamant of I'm going to take two million dollars a year in order for the Dodgers to acquire the pieces that they need to win a World Series, which is like speaks, I think, volumes to his intangibles and who he is as a human being. But from that perspective, I definitely think that it's. Um, definitely a two-way street because of all the reasons you mentioned, Kate, about the player who says, okay, well, I'm going to play in Chicago for the Cubs right now, but like I make my home in Florida. I would prefer to get like four or $5 million down the road rather than having 40% of it be taken off right now. Right, right. You know what else is interesting to me about baseball is, you know, how involved are you in the, the feeder teams or the seed teams, right? I, you know, I think it's probably very rare. I know the NBA does it with G League, but – you know, the NFL doesn't have a feeder or a lower level. That's college, basically, which is why they're there for three years. Like, how involved are you or were you with any of, like, the double A, triple A, single A baseball teams? Because a lot of these kids go there, and they're in the triple A's for 10 years, and then they go pro. How involved or how much attention are you guys actually paying to that, those different levels within the organization? They're super important, and I would say – Moneyball 2.0, like the next phase in baseball, at first it was player evaluation. So how do we take players and how do we say, oh, you're undervalued, like you get on base a lot, but people aren't paying for you to get on base, they're paying for home runs. Now it's a player development revolution. So you take those guys who are double A AA or triple A and you say to Brian Van Bell at the Red Sox, your changeup's awesome, your Forcing fastball with ride is really good. So you're working north south really well, but we want to teach you how to develop a cutter so you can come in on guys, right? So that type of thinking that's taking existing assets that you have and making them better rather than going out and trying to acquire other players. So Mm -hmm. it's really fascinating because you're like, you're recognizing that players aren't static. And I think the Rays and the Astros do an awesome job of they take relievers who maybe 
are burned out or haven't had a lot of performance and they say, hey, these are the two pitches that you throw that we really like. We only want you to throw those two pitches. We think if you follow our formula, you'll have success and then they do it. So I think um, there are a number of teams who recognize that and facilities like Driveline out in Washington, they do a really good job of taking players and say, hey, we can make you better. Don't think that you're totally discarded because you maybe had a few bad seasons. Do they, for you guys in the in MLB, it seems like there's just such a high level of investment and in development mm-hmm. is what I get from you, right? It's not talent identification, it's development. It's like, okay, you are 50% good, we can take your 50% and make you 95% and develop you to 95% instead of saying, we're just trying to find the 95% guy. Mm-hmm. Is that because they're such young? I mean, what is the normal age, is there an age, forgive my ignorance, of like, going into MLB, like they're very young, correct? So you I'd say yeah, like mid twenties is typically yeah. usual, like players peak at around 27. Um, but mm-hmm. like you sign guys out of like the Dominican or Venezuela when they're like 15 or 16, right. and then it can take like seven or eight years to get to the big leagues. That's a huge investment to like bring them in and, and have them do it. And what, you know, what for you, when you look at MLB, what is the one thing that you think really sets them apart in leagues, right? Like there's all these leagues and all these different things. Is there something that you feel like knowing what you know kind of under the hood that they're doing and getting right that other leagues could benefit from? Ooh, interesting question. I think that the narrative... Other than hiring you, Katie. Everybody needs to (laughs) come. I'm sitting here like, Katie, you need to come on over here. I'm going to need you to sit right next to me. I would love to work with you two. You guys let me know. (laughs) (laughs) We're like, no, too fast. You're counting too fast, Katie. And I... (laughs) <laughs> I actually, I was on a call earlier today. Um, we were going over like some roadmap things and I, I um, was on with one of my female coworkers. So I was like, Hey, can we girl math this really quick? I'm super confused. By it. <laughs> she was like, yeah, let's girl math. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, I, I think MLB for a few years, it had like this really bad narrative of like, things are too slow. It's antiquated. And then like the rule changes came in suddenly everyone mm-hmm. was like, Oh, baseball is great again. And it's like 20 minutes shorter. So I definitely <laughs> feel like a, a seesawing of narratives. Um, something that I love about baseball that I think is really exciting that's continuing to expand internationally. So obviously, like the NFL has games um, in Europe, like the NBA, I think, has done a really cool job of appealing to markets in Asia. I think baseball is now recognizing, whether it's like through the London series or the games coming up in a few weeks in South Korea, that there is like a really robust Asian baseball market in particular. And like to lean into that and to take advantage of it. I love being part of that in my role at Hawkeye and like talking to the teams in Japan. I was in Tokyo for a week in September and hearing their use cases, like all of that I think is really fascinating. It definitely represents probably like the last frontier in many respects of another market of fans. Wow. I know. Katie, what? What is the ultimate dream? Like, what do you want to be? Like, I'm just listening to you. Kate and I are both kind of like looking at each other like, oh my gosh. Like, as you're like giving me Jess's numbers, like, what is the ultimate dream job for you? I've ruminated on a few different paths, Megan. I would honestly, I'd love to be commissioner someday. I think like being in New York and being the custodian of the sport would be I love that. really Being cool. into existence, Katie, do it right yes. now. <laughs> I'll write it on my notebook. Commissioner is coming. I think um, like following in Kim's path and being a GM would be really cool to like be at that top of the organization and to leverage the different departments and to say like, we are competing for a world series. This is how we're going to do it. I'd love to coach again someday, like to be in a big league dugout and to be in uniform. Like that was an experience that absolutely changed my life and was one of the coolest things, as I said, at the start of this. So to have that chance to like be part of a 162 game season and some playoff games would be really awesome. So many games. When you, were on, when you were on the bench and you're in the dugout, I mean, look, I, I work in, we all three of us work in, in men's sports. And mm-hmm. there's sometimes people say things that, you know, might necessarily, they might want to take back or have a different way of saying or approaching things uh, from a temperament level. Um, did you ever have an experience like where you were like, I, I can't believe you just said that and I need to educate you on why we don't say that? Or is baseball pretty tempered? I mean, I think I've seen a couple guys throw bats, smash helmets, you know, but the dugout is right behind, I'm sorry, the locker room oftentimes is right behind the dugout. Mm-hmm. Right? So you can kind of like shove them down in there as opposed to ours are on sidelines and they're like, okay, to walk you out of here, everybody's going to see, you can kind of sneak them back in the back and, and might get mm-hmm. away with it. 
Is it like really intense in there or is it just a good time? Because like the Savannah bananas are just like, I think <laughs> like, I love it. But is that like normal or is it more like super hyper focused? You know, there's a lot of guys. Yeah. Really interesting question. I would say like across the board, like whether it's in the clubhouse or on bus rides, like I never had a bad interaction with a player. And the respect that they showed me and the way that they treated me, like for the rest of my life, I will be so grateful for. Um, I think like what you're referencing, Kate, I have a friend who worked with me at MLB who also like worked for the Jets. And he said like, because it's such a physical game, because football is so aggressive, it was like really hard for guys to turn it off. Right. Mm -hmm. So they'd be in the like locker room and like skirmishes would break out all the time because they're just in that mode. I would say in baseball, it's not really the same way. Um, like sometimes you'll get guys who like swear or throw helmets and stuff, but I, I would say I was like never really intimidated by that at all. You know, like I, I definitely like the pressure they're under is absurd. So like if they flare up, I would try to empathize with them more than anything and duck out of the way if <laughs> a helmet like, or anything was coming down the deck. I'm going to scoot over here. <laughs> when you said you felt, you know, you felt really comfortable on the bench, right? You felt really comfortable in the dugout. Is that because there were people in leadership positions that commanded and demanded that for you? I think, you know, we talked earlier about having women in leadership and women um, really kind of set the tone. They're oftentimes men and a lot of times men. So sometimes they don't know how to be around. I know um, Deion Sanders is really big with his female staff of, you know, you will respect them the way you do any of the other men in this room. Is there, was there a tone set with you since you're kind of breaking that ceiling of like, this is different and we're going to act different? Or was it just an understood thing? Yeah, really good question, Kate. There definitely were, um, I think, conversations headed into the season where people said, like, Katie's here for a reason, like, treat her with respect. But I think, like, what was unspoken that meant the most to me is, like, when players would come up to me and ask me questions. Mm -hmm. Like, Chris Murphy, who made his debut last year, wanted to know why the Red Sox were telling him to not throw his curveball. He's like, can you look at the numbers? Can you tell me? I think it's a really good pitch. I think it's better than my slider. And I agreed with him. So, like, from that perspective... Obviously, he was being respectful, but like the fact that no one told him to come up and ask me and say, hey, pick his brain. She knows what she's talking about. Like, <laughs> the fact that word got around and they were like, hey, she can help you. And her only agenda is to be here and assist us. Like that to me is what meant the world. Like it was awesome that people like were cognizant and didn't like change right in front of me. Like that was very nice, too. But like <laughs> people like, ask my opinion on baseball or to have like Kyle Hart show me like, hey, Katie, like this is how I want to throw my slider. What do you think? Like he doesn't realize how crazy that is that he's asking me someone who's five, four and 25 years old, how to throw a slider. But like, I, I know what a big deal that is. And so I, I really like always took it to heart and was very grateful for it. And is that what you're doing in the dugout? Are you like analyzing like the numbers when like, you know, if Otani's pitching the ball or whoever it is, like, is that what you're doing and the players are coming up to you? Like, what are you doing in your time in the dugout. She has her ear pod in. She's listening to her favorite music, living her best <laughs> life, eating sunflower seeds, you know. <laughs> Double level. <laughs> um, I would say in the dugout was like very hitting focused, but everything yeah. leading up to the game was all about pitching. So like what I said about Brian Van Bell and helping him develop a cutter, thinking about like how do you more efficiently deliver the baseball. But like when you're in the dugout, I would have like different documents prepared for the relievers who would come in. So let's say we had a starting pitcher and then um, like our all this Chapman had like a big league rehab assignment. So maybe he would come in. And so we would have information on the way his pitches move, his usage, usage rates. And then that moment, you basically have like two or three seconds. Like you would see the reliever come in, the guys would like come over and huddle around me and the hitting coach. We would have video on iPads that they could look at of the reliever. Um, and so you have to say really quickly what they need to know. And so then I also had to understand, okay, it's Hudson Potts. The only thing Hudson Potts cares about for the new reliever is his max fastball below. So the only thing I have to say to Hudson is 98, right? Like I don't need to say to him, oh, he's got a slider and a changeup, and it's kind of like a weak changeup. Like I'm not going to sit there and like pontificate about what he needs to do because Hudson has to like go walk from the on-deck circle to home plate. So from that perspective, it was like definitely like probably the shortest window that I've ever had in my career to communicate with someone information that was absolutely critical and had a really like low latency and short shelf life. Fascinating. And do you feel like having, you know, how close are teams oftentimes have like bonding and they're all really close and they all kind of understand the dynamic of each other and, and what people need? Because everybody needs something different to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. 40 guys on a roster is mm -hmm. that right how do you yeah how do you navigate that knowing each of them 
need something to be communicated potentially differently and their success model might look different for each person. How did you navigate that in your role? Yeah, it takes time, honestly, Kate. And I feel like like thinking about my dad who has like 10 or 11 direct reports, like most of his day is speaking with them and making sure that they're okay. You know, like it's not necessarily like he's, he's putting together spreadsheets, but like his role as an individual contributor is way less important than making sure everyone has the tools they need to succeed. So for me, like it started in spring training with the Red Sox, like getting to know the guys. And a lot of the conversations weren't baseball related. You know, it was like, where are you from? Like, oh, you like your wife's having your first child. Is it a boy or a girl? Like all of those things that I think built a level of trust where guys would be more comfortable, like letting their hair down with me. And then like you, you see people at their best and their worst, you know, like it's a super long season, like we talked about. And so, you know, who can handle the pressure, you know, who like really loves sports, you know, who just needs it as a job. And I think coaching was like the first time that I really understood. Like there are plenty of people who they, maybe they like baseball, but they also want to get their money and they want to get out. And so I think like, I, I definitely respect that and I understand it, but it was interesting to see that firsthand of the guys who are like, I want to get paid. I don't know if you guys have experienced that in football or basketball, but it's, um, it's not necessarily like, Oh, I'm, I'm the kid who used to play little league and go to Dairy Queen after the games. Like I, I know this is my job and this is what I have to do. I think that's just so important now because when we say, especially for me with my team, like, you know, there are people, like at the end of the day, so many people, I was just having this conversation with one of the guys in my office was, and he said, I wanted to take a picture with an athlete and he was kind of like off put by it. And I said, you have to remember you're one of how many, mm-hmm. right? They interact with on a daily basis. So that moment in time is just a snapshot, but like, they're just people. And totally. you know, to be able to put that, turn it on, turn it off, but then constantly be under the microscope. I mean, your staff, so there's 40 players. How many staff are on that team? Um, so we'd have like 26 guys who are active, like in the big league clubhouse. You can have guys who are on the 40 man who are at the minor league affiliates. I would say staff members, like they've ballooned pretty significantly. The Giants last year probably had like 15 staff members. Right. So I mean, they're super small. Yeah. It's, it is one of those where there's a lot of staff watching everything that you do and anything can impact, you know, your playing time or what your opportunity is or what someone's opinion is. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like for you being one of the only women that people gravitated more towards you? We find so often here with our guests, even in Megan and I's experiences, you know, people sometimes feel a little bit less threatened when there's a softer version or a message that's delivered a little softer or Mm -hmm. more tastefully um, through a woman's lens than like just like a guy barking at you. And it's like, look, I'm about to tell you this isn't going to make you feel good, but it is what it is. Let's have this conversation instead of sometimes the male approach is that like, let me just bark at you and hope you understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. That tough love. Yeah. For a yeah. lot of guys, like they don't respond to that. And especially in baseball, like I think like that get in your face energy, like maybe it has a place in football and baseball, but I would definitely say like I had a very different approach than the other coaches. And I think right. it worked for me. And right. I think like one of the most meaningful moments was we had done like a play ball clinic so it was like a few players and a lot of kids. And afterwards I was walking back with one of our players and he just like sat down in the outfield. And so I sat down next to him, we were just talking and he talked about his mental health and how difficult it was for him that like other people in the Red Sox organization knew about it. Like, so he felt comfortable talking to some people, but you know, he said things to me like Katie, the only time where everything's quiet is when I'm playing baseball, right? Like, like that type of like sharing, I think, you know, I was, I felt very privileged that he was comfortable enough to disclose it to me. And I think it also probably was because I wasn't the tough love coach, you know, I wasn't like standing there and shouting at the guys. So they probably did feel more comfortable sharing on and off field stuff with me than they might've been like my male counterparts. Yeah. Have you ever been asked to provide that feedback? I always say like, sometimes you're like, how did you get them to do that? Or how did you have that conversation? And it's like, oh, I don't know. I just did. Yeah. <laughs> you just, you know, I, it's the same way I have every conversation. I'm not sure. But then do you think, have you ever been in a situation where someone's like asking you for guidance on how to approach or realize seeing that your conversations are getting different results than what mm-hmm. theirs are from a male perspective? I think sometimes they pridefully don't want to lean in. Uh, I think what, that way too, we don't want to pridefully lean in and ask another woman how to do something or give mm-hmm. advice to. Um, have you ever been in a situation where they've kind of tapped you to say, hey, like, yeah, give us a different perspective, give us a different mindset on how to achieve what we want or accomplish what we want through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I can tell like you both do this very well, just from this conversation. I think like authenticity is really important. I think in sports, people can like sniff out pretty easily who's posturing, who's pretending to know stuff that they don't. So from my perspective, I think 
like you obviously have to be strong and confident. And we would often say like, no matter what's going on behind the scenes as a staff, like the players can't necessarily know that things are going awry. And it's really important to have that united front. But in terms of like the way that I would recommend someone to communicate, I think empathy is paramount. And I think it's so easy for us to see players and staff as replaceable, but they're not. And the willingness like to listen, you know, and to like really ruminate on what's being told, what's being withheld. I think that to me is so important. You know, like people often say to me, oh, Katie, like we love when you talk, talk more. But I feel like the more I can listen, the more I can absorb, like the better for me. Yeah, no, that's so special. And I'm curious too, because when you talk about all the analytics and everything that you're doing, you're with the players all the time, they're looking at you. How are you able to balance, like have that work-life balance? Because I just feel like you are so deep in baseball. Kate and I have that problem all the time when we're in season. It's just like all football, all basketball. So like, (laughs) what do you do? Do you binge anything? How do you separate yourself? Do you have time to hang out with friends and family, you know? When oh gosh, Megan, for the longest time I didn't, <laughs> you know, like at MLB in Cincinnati, like there definitely would be times where I'd be able to like see my friends from Northwestern. Um, but like you miss a lot, you know, like when you're coaching, like you're not around for Easter, you're not around for birthdays. I'd say that's been like one of the really nice things about Hawkeye and being in this role that is remote. And so I'm traveling to see teams, but like if my boyfriend and I want to play tennis on a Friday afternoon and grab dinner, you know, I'm not going to get an eight o'clock Slack message and just say, Hey, Uh, were you able to fill out those scouting reports on the pirates, you know? So I, from that perspective, it's quite lovely, but I also, it's very foreign in some ways because I feel like I was so used to like the 10 and the 12 hour days and all of the travel. So now like nine hours per day seems like crazy. So I'm still adjusting to that. I would say. (laughs) She's like, wait, the day's over. You guys don't have more things to do. Wait, no, 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 anything. Yeah, no. And, And I think that's one thing, especially for these young, um, young people that want to get into sports, I think they get caught up a lot in the glitz and the glamour of what is sports. And I oftentimes remind them that what you see is is not the actual job. It's the burden of the job that's portrayed. And you hit it right on the head, right? You're working 14 hour days, 18 hours. I'm in the office. I'm actually in the office till 10 o'clock tonight. Like it is yeah, literally yeah. long days. And then the next day you get to be like, I'm going to do it again. And then eventually you're like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> I need to see my friends. I want to like have a life. How do you keep? And I think when you were younger, I struggled with that, Katie, when I was younger. And mm-hmm. I say this all the time. It's like, have a balance where you don't lose who you are. It's, it's, it's what you do. It's not who you are. Mm-hmm. And it's so hard to hear when you're young because you're climbing the yeah. ladder. You're pushing people out of the way. You're trying to make a way because so many people want to be in sports. As you do that now, do you try and in this new role and less uh, time on the day clock, we'll call it, right? Do you kind of look back and say, what was I doing, right? Like I could have managed my time a little bit better or are you like, I enjoyed that and that allowed me to see what I needed to contribute to more because it took away from what I ultimately decided I wanted to spend my time on. Yeah, it's a good question, Kate. And I'm glad that you also kind of struggled with it when you were forging your career. Oh my God, I struggle with it. I'm like, oh, I was just, I, I, <laughs> to ask Megan, I'm like, would, would I love to just go to dinner? Yes. Do I, I have 30 minutes, but I've, I've tried to like, I, I've, I've tried to put people in my life that keep me grounded where it's like, you need to do this. You need to go take your, one of your employees to lunch. You need to have mm-hmm. conversations with people as people because you'll get more from them on the work side of things when they feel connected to you on the human side of things. Mm-hmm. Or I'm like, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this I don't have time for this lunch. I don't even eat lunch. This <laughs> is not me. But I have to cognizantly say, no, this is what they need. So it's not about what I need to be successful. It's what's going to them be successful, which is to get a version of me that isn't just your boss. It's like, I actually care that, you know, we're talking about what's going on in the news, not definitely did you give me that report. You know, it's like, it's not, no one teaches you that. Are you teaching that in your class, Katie? Is that a class? To- <laughs> yes. Yes. There's, 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 there's no, it's, it's like, there's no class in that. And there's no, it's people skills. And I think you have to fail to be like, I missed a lot and I don't want to do that anymore because I can't get the time back. But that's why when you work with people that value your time, it matters because you're like, I appreciate it. You realize how much I'm sacrificing to help you chase your dream, right? You're sacrificing all these hours doing all this analytics to help these guys become better Mm -hmm. when they respect you for it. It's worth, it makes you feel like, Hey, it matters to them. It's not just me doing my job. They value me as a person and what I contribute. Mm -hmm. And when you get that, that's magic. It's the ones that don't, you're like, 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. But no, so you did struggle with it. You had a hard time, like balancing. Yeah, so, yeah, I was ruminating on that. Honestly, Kate, like looking back, there's part of me that thinks, wow, I should have been more present when I was at the draft in 2018 or like when I'm sitting on um, a bus ride that might seem super long, but in actuality, you know, like I, I wanted to be more appreciative of the things that have happened. But I also feel like if I didn't necessarily have that mentality or that attitude of, oh, what's next, I probably wouldn't be where I am. So like I, I try to give myself grace in that respect and that, yes, I probably should have taken a step back and like walked out of the MLB offices or walked out of the Reds offices and gone, wow, holy cow, like if 10 year old me could see me now. But by the same token, I think if I had gotten complacent, I probably wouldn't have pushed myself to the areas that I have. Um, so what I try to do now is like if I'm like with friends, I focus on just being with friends. If I'm working, I try to have that. If I'm grading, I'm grading. I've never been a really good multitasker. Um, so I feel like when I can just block into what I'm doing, then I don't feel guilty. You know, like if I'm focusing on my boyfriend and I having dinner, that's the priority right now. You're not a good multitasker. What are you talking about? I don't even understand how you can even say that. That's I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I can't do things simultaneously well. Like my boyfriend will like be reading for like law school and watching Parks and Rec. And I'm like, how do you do that at the same time? I get that. I get yeah. that. that. That's you, beyond me. But I feel like I can juggle tough, well. Are you a tough grader? I want to know. You have to take your class. I need to know. Like, are we are we, uh, we going to skirt by with a solid B, yeah. or are we going to really have to be uh, asking for tutoring after class? Because I feel like Beth and I are going to be like in the tutor center. I, I would say I definitely like I'll give out A's when they're deserving. You know, like I definitely know there are professors where it's like, oh, like you have to achieve this lofty threshold. I honestly like speaking about like the non glamorous side of sports. I try to be like really candid about the odds, and I don't share that with students to be demoralizing. But like when they're talking about, oh, I like I was on the phone with some the other day who wants to be a GM, but he's like 27. He has like no baseball experience on his resume. You know, like the odds are a little bit against you in that case. And so I, I try to like have this balance of like I want to encourage them and I want them to pursue their dreams. But I also want them to know how statistically difficult it is to get these jobs. Like my career has been improbable, like every step of the way. I know that like the fact that I've been able to like combine these roles is absurd. Like I, even though I, I have like. I've put in the work and I have the resume, like the chance to get hired by the Red Sox, like one in a million, the chance to get hired by Google, like very, very low. So I also, when I'm speaking to students and they're asking for advice, I, I want them to know like you can do it, but you have to be strategic. Wow. That's Look at Moneyball inspiring her. And now it's, know. it's like ballers where she's like, no, that's not real. That's just <laughs> not real. This is I not know. Real. There's, there's versions that inspire and then there's versions you're just like, that is a complete bull. Like that is not even it. No. No. I literally want to watch Moneyball now because I've like seen him like, oh, that's just too much. But now like talking to Katie, I'm like, well, maybe I should watch Moneyball and I'll be like, you know, this in NFL maybe. Do it. I think we're going to have Megan's going to be like, Kate, I watched Moneyball. So I, uh, <laughs> I'm i going to go work with Katie now. Okay, like, oh, okay good. See you later. Stop Kate for Katie. It's fine. <laughs> It's fine. What do you, um, for you, you know, you want to be a GM, you want to be a commissioner. We're going to speak that into existence for you. What do you, yeah, we, for sure. We're all about it. It oh, happens. Yes. Well, so yes. Don't forget yes. about us, the small people, not in the class. Those over here. <laughs> <Absolutely. I'm> like, <laughs> we up in the bleachers. Like, I know. I know. <laughs> what do you, what do you want to say to the next you? What do you want to say to the next girl that watches this? That says, I didn't know that I could do this and I want to be her. What would you say to her? Ooh, I would tell her the impossible is a construct and you're the only person who can define what you can do. Mm. Oh my gosh. Wow. So powerful. Wow. That is so powerful. Look, I'm saying, look, I, I have my notes. Of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like feeling it. your little lines. Then you're like studying for pop quizzes. That should be on like a t-shirt. I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. I know. I like that. Like, that's That'd be cool. It's so true because I feel like so many times as a woman, you have to be overprepared. Mm -hmm. All of our gonna say hands down, the key to success is being overprepared because mm -hmm. they will look at you as someone who can be pinpointed as not prepared and then you get to shock them when you are. And then they're like, oh, well shit, I can't really, mm -hmm. I can't, I'm not gonna work this time. And they're like, yeah, no, keep them moving. <laughs> and then that level of, you know, the standard for you is up there. What you've done is so amazing. It really I is. I'm so, Thank you guys. 
it, it is other than I don't want to be in your class because I feel like I just would not be <laughs> same <laughs> I, mean, I, wanna be in class, but I don't want to have to take like a test or anything because I feel like I just is beyond I would I would not walk out of there feeling good because I'd be like okay well so you guys have like the leadership the organizational theory stuff totally down it's like those soft skills you know like you advance when you're young on the technical skills I feel like and then when you're at leadership position it's all about like how do you get people to believe in you it's people management. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that is half of it. I mean, that's, I say all the time to young girls is, you know, you can be as educated as you want to be, but can you convey it in a way that people believe it, understand it and respect it? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. Down the key because just Perfect. because you're saying it doesn't make them believe it, doesn't make them right. respect you for saying it and doesn't make them appreciate why you're saying it. Right. And that's, what's hard because nowadays everybody wants that like instant gratification and you're like, Oh honey, like you're 27 year old guy. Dude, you're like 10 years away from us having this conversation. So like, <laughs> come back, you know, when, you, when you've done X, Y, and Z, instead of that, like, instant, I'm going to be the first 28-year-old PM. Yeah, like, love the dream. <laughs> love the dream. Land the plane. Like, let's, let's land this plane here on this one. But now and I think like there's humility to it, too, Kate. Like, I have some students, like, who substantiate, like, oh, I should work for the Chiefs because, like, I'm a football strategy expert. Maybe you are. But maybe you've also never worked for a football team before. And so, like, there's a difference between, like, working for a team versus, like, watching, you know, Red Zone every yeah. time, right? Like, like yeah. humility is really important, too. Like, I yeah. don't know everything there is to know about baseball. Like, I'm, like, very cognizant that I have more to learn. But so I would never, like, turn myself as that. So I think, like, people also have to be like, very aware of, like, how you're perceived if you think that you've already got it all figured out. Well, you can always learn something from everybody, you know, and I think those, the people that are the most successful are the people that are curious. Yes. When you're like, ask questions. If you don't understand, don't be afraid to say that. Ask, seek to understand, not to hear. Mm-hmm. And it's just so important because everybody now needs to have confidence, but there's a difference between like confidence, because I love me some Deion Sanders and his confidence. <laughs> you say that. But at the same time, it's some people find it inf- offensive and intimidating. But for him, it's what drives him, right? Mm-hmm. And, it's part, and it allows him to lead. It comes from a place of leadership. And so that's where, you know, the interpersonal skills are just so important. And you said earlier, you said communication and something else was the key. What was that? Um, communication empathy? Oh, yeah, you, it, but it's, it's just being able to communicate with people, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the hardest part is being able to have conversations on any level executive lower level and everything in between is so so important because you're going to run across all of those people throughout your career and sports is small you never know who you're going to be working for next week because Mm -hmm. this this goes down you're like oh yeah awesome good to see you that was awesome yeah Yeah. it's a small closed ecosystem for sure it is it is is. well i want to were you okay for last question for google I've heard all these crazy things about Google offices. Were you in the office at Google or not? Were you remote? I was remote from Chicago, oh. but I've been in a few offices. The New York one's crazy. If you guys ever get a chance, get lunch at the New York office. Can you take a cell phone? <laughs> you like, have a credential that you can get us in? Like, can we get a guest pass from you and just like go over there? Yes, please. Like- so yeah. the, um, the guy, this was when I was Thank at the my friend, um, John Franklin, who just won the amazing race. We went to Northwestern together. So we got lunch together. So I got, I can hook you guys up with John and then he can get you oh. lunch. And you can talk amazing race. You can talk about what it's like to be a million dollars richer. <laughs> I can't. My kids just started watching that show. Oh, really? I love it. I could never go on it because some of that stuff, I'd be like, mm-hmm. no, tapped out. <laughs> no, nope. don't care. Not a million dollars. Not 10. Nothing. <laughs> not eating bugs or anything. Yeah, no. Mm-mm. Can't do it. But this one, I'm like, oh, I could do that. I could build that little statue. That could be fine. And then he said, <laughs> what would get me, Kate, is he said, like, you're not, like, told what to bring. And, like, because you're carrying all your stuff, it's not like you can bring, like, a book. You're not allowed, like, your phone. <laughs> so I would, my... I would truly like blow my brains out not being able to like read or be on those 15 hour flights and just like be You're dead tired. They're mm-hmm. like, I just, I think like, they're knocked out. They're like, I, they're like, I don't want to read. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm just going to lay down and sleep because when I get up, I have to run. Mm-hmm. Like, they run everywhere. Oh my gosh. All right. Adding Amazing Race to my list. Moneyball, Amazing Race. <laughs> well, Thanks I, to watch. Because I'm like, where do they sleep? Where do they eat? Like, where's their clothes? Because they wear the same clothes in every episode, Megan. Oh, so I'm wow. like, are they washing their clothes or do they have to bring like five of the same clothes because they're dressed as a team? Oh. I'm just like, yeah, I know. I want I'm, I want to talk to him because I want to know yeah. the inner workings. I want to see yeah. like how hard is it actually because, yeah, oh. it's jump off this building. Yeah, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Oh my God, not happening. No. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been so fun. You are just, I, I am so proud of you for the barriers that you're breaking, but I'm so inspired by you and just how poised and confident you are and just curious you are to continue to grow in your path and take the next step. You're not stuck in one place. You're continuing to grow and evolve. And I think that's the key to everybody's success and happiness is continuing to evolve and grow every step of the way. So it's been so fun. Yeah. Oh, this was awesome. Thank you both for having me. Um, like truly, I love this platform. I love the concept. So it, it's really a privilege and an honor. Thank you. Well, listen, we're going to get you to get us to Kim. Kim's next. I want to, I, I want to know what's going on with yeah. Kim. Like Katie nominated you. But she, <laughs> right. Well, she changed your life. So I want her to know that she changed your life and your path. And just like for you, for that young girl, like sometimes it's good to hear that, but no, it's amazing. Okay. Well, I want to know, I want to see you work out. I want to see your fastball. I'm not in for the fastball. <laughs> I can run some bases and steal bases and that kind of stuff. No. <laughs> we'll go to a spring training game soon. Let's do it. As long as we can sit in the stands and you can tell us exactly what's going on. Megan and I are going to be like, what? Yeah. Uh-huh. Pass the popcorn? Oh, yeah. You want a beer? Anybody want a beer? <laughs> Megan and I will drink out of beer bats. We'll be yeah. out with the beer bats. <laughs> I love it. Well, Megan, that was so inspiring to hear that from Katie. I mean, honestly, she started out in history, went to work at Google, went to the Red Sox, and now she's championing creating, like, a whole new space for herself within the world of MLB. I mean, it is hearing her talk about her path and how it wasn't designed, it was created. Just, it's mm -hmm. so refreshing to know that you don't have to know where you're going to end up to be able to get there. It was so interesting. I loved her, like just having the conversation with her, learning about the baseball analytics side. And something that was so cool was like, all the players respect her so much. And she comes into the dugout and there's a player, a MLB player coming up to Katie and asking her a question. Like that is such a cool thing. And like, that doesn't happen often. And for her being like, you know, having so much success in such a short amount of time is so respectable and so impressive. And I am like here for it. And I love that for her. I know we're going to speak her commissioner of the league into existence for her. That's what she wants for herself. And I love that she isn't limiting herself. I mean, one of the things that she said that, that I'm taking away from this is spend your life studying for pop quizzes. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as women, that's constantly what we're on is just a hot plate of like, stuff getting thrown at us. So that's such great knowledge to take away and just be prepared for anything at any moment. She's a fantastic guest. I mean, honestly, she's, I don't want to go up against her like in a math race or on the field. Cause I think I'm right. going to lose hands down either way. <laughs> but I love how much she is able to give back to the next version of her. And because Kim, one lady gave her a chance and an opportunity to succeed. She now feels driven by that and purposeful in that as making sure the next version of her has that same opportunity that Kim gave to her. That's what her table is all about. Doing it. I for love them. it. I love it. I love, I love it. it. No. Katie, so good having Katie on her table. Make sure to our audience to like, comment, and let us know who you'd like to have on the show next. We're really appreciating your guys' engagement with the show, and we're like loving the, you know, paying for this woman's success in sports. Let's keep it going. So make sure to tune in to her table next time. We'll see you guys soon.